I'm reading this morning from the book of Matthew in chapter 5. I want to read the first three verses to begin our message here today. I'm preaching a message titled, Poor in Spirit, and this is taken from the Sermon on the Mount. Reading in verse 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Heavenly Father, we do ask your blessings upon the reading of thy precious word here today. And Father, we pray that thy will to be done, and Lord, that you would speak to our hearts by thy spirit and by thy word. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I have preached in the past a number of times from this text. In 2006, we did a series um well, actually, we did one sermon and combined all of the Beatitudes. And then in 2013, we did a series on the whole uh, text here, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the whole Sermon on the Mount series. My meditations this week has been upon verse 3. In verse 3, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What I want to do is just spend a little bit of time here in this passage, and this may lead me to preach on some of the other Beatitudes as the weeks come. Now, when we come to this passage and we come to this text, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, we find this is the first of our Lord's discourses. We have um, other discourses in Matthew 24 and John in the book of John as well, in chapter 13 through 17. But this is the first of our Lord's discourses, and Jesus began his ministry in this manner. This would be the first year of his ministry. Now, the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount is uh, to instruct his disciples on kingdom living. We find the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, mentioned a number of times in this discourse. We find that virtually every part of this sermon, that is the Sermon on the Mount, virtually every part of this sermon is seen elsewhere in the New Testament. We're talking about the laws of the kingdom. A high standard is set here for believers. And we find that this Sermon on the Mount is not popular in many churches today. And we find that this sermon is the opposite of, world, of the world's view. Now, in verses 1 through 9, the Sermon on the Mount opens with what we refer to as the Beatitudes, which are attributes that ought to be. In other words, when we come to the Beatitudes, we see here what it means to be a Christian and to enter into the kingdom of God. Now notice in verse 1 and 2, and I'm just giving you uh, an introduction at the moment. In a few moments, we're going to come to our outline. And our outline, number one, is the meaning of being poor in spirit. The second thing we're going to look at today is the examples of being poor in spirit. God has given us many examples in His Word. And the third thing that we'll look at is the reward of being poor in spirit. Now, in verses 1 and 2, notice carefully as we read this, I want you to see that this is intended for the disciples, that is, for believers. He says in verse 1 and 2, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... So what we're beginning to read here in this chapter and in this sermon, it is written, it is given, his teachings is given to the disciples, that is, for believers as you and I today. Now, as we come to the Sermon on the Mount, and as we come here especially to the Beatitudes, we find that this is a description of the character and conduct of those who are citizens of the kingdom. In other words, as we began the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes, again, especially verses 1 through 9 or verses 1 through 12, 
we find here that this describes the qualities that abide in the life of believers. We find this is a picture of what it means to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. What we're going to be reading here, and especially beginning in poor in spirit, we find here that not only are these the characteristics of Christ, but in our life there is to be a Christ likeness. So it, this, these Beatitudes teach us what it means to be a Christian. And as we read through this text and the entire sermon, we find clearly the difference, the contrast between the saved and the lost. Now, if we look through the Beatitudes, we find he begins each one of these with the word blessed. The word blessed has the ideal of joy. This is a Christian distinction that we find in the Word of God. For instance, uh, we find in Psalms 1 and verse 1, Blessed is the man, he goes on to say there, that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but delights in the law of God. So the word blessed has the ideal of being highly favored or to speak well of. And I may mention some more about this word blessed a little later in the sermon. But in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. This is a Christian word. And again, it is a Christian distinction speaking of that which is highly favored or to speak well of. And as we come here, we see in verse 4, blessed are they that mourn. In verse 5, blessed are the meek. In verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst. In verse 7, blessed are the merciful. In verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart. And then in verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. So as we began here in in verse 3, reading this again, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is a profound statement given to us by the Lord. Now, each one of these Beatitudes has three parts. That's reason I just mentioned my outline. Number one is going to be the meaning of being poor in spirit. Number two, examples of being poor in spirit. And number three, the reward of being poor in spirit. Each one of these Beatitudes has three parts. First of all, there is a statement of happiness that is mentioned by using the word blessed. Each one of them begins with the word blessed. And then secondly, the character is stated. For instance, in verse 3, first of all, blessed. And then he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So the character of the individual is stated. And number three, uh, the reward is mentioned for each case. In other words, those who are poor in spirit, those who are meek, those who mourn, those who are merciful and are pure in heart and are peacemakers, we find that God has promised a reward for each and every one of these. Now, let's get into our outline here this morning. And notice with me as we come again to verse 3. I'll ask you to hold on to verse 3 throughout the big part of the sermon because we're going to keep coming back to this and, and, in other words, keep reading this so that we can get this down in our hearts and mind. Now, first point here today is the meaning of being poor in spirit. He's talking about poverty of spirit. Now, let me just say this. this. This is the first, and I believe the order is very important. For without the principle that's given to us in verse 3, no one can enter into God's kingdom. And without the principle that's given to us here in verse verse 3, none of the others would uh, make it, would, they would not matter. In other words, they would not uh, be important to us without having verse 3. So he says in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Again, verse 3, this first beatitude lays the foundation for all of the others. Again, without it, nothing else matters. Now, in verse 3, 
when he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, this is not speaking of financial poverty. For there is no virtue in poverty or wealth when we're talking about eternal things. But I do want to make mention of a parallel passage. I'm going to ask you to hold on to Matthew chapter 3, and I'm going to be reading in Luke chapter 6. Now, Luke chapter 6 very well may be talking about actual physical poverty. I'm reading in verse 20. Notice with me in verse 20. And again, this is a parallel passage. So let us spend just a few moments talking about uh, physical poverty. He says here in verse 20, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now I want you to think about this just for a moment. This is a parallel passage. And this here may be speaking of actual poverty. If taken rightly, we know that physical poverty can lead us to the Lord. In other words, it can lead us uh, to trust Him not only for physical things, but also for spiritual things as well. I want to read in Luke chapter 18... In Luke chapter 18, I want to read uh, a number of verses in, in this passage. In Luke chapter 18, I'd like to read verse 24 and 25. Now, this is the story. Began, it begins in verse 18. It is the story of a rich ruler. And we see he's mentioned as a certain ruler in verse 18. And then he's referred to as being very rich in verse 23. And the Lord knows the hearts of each and every one of us, and He knows what keeps each and every one of us from coming to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And this man had professed to have kept the law, except for the area of finances. And the Lord even said in verse 22, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast. In other words, the Lord knew where his problem was at. His mind and heart was fixed upon uh, uh, financial things. Now notice, I want to read in verse 24 and 25, and I want you to notice now, let's, I want to spend a few moments talking about physical poverty. Then we're going to go back to our text and talk about spiritual poverty. Because that's really what Matthew 5, 3 is talking about. But first of all, let's spend just a few moments on this subject of physical poverty. We know that poverty does make it easier to come to the Lord, to trust Him. When a person is destitute physically speaking, financially speaking, uh, they understand what it's like to accept help from someone or to admit that they're in need. And when we read here in this text, dealing with the rich ruler and the Lord dealing with his heart, it says in verse 24 and 25, And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And, of course, in verse 26 and 27, And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. In other words, God can change the heart. God can bring repentance in a person's life, and whereby they can be saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want you to notice that in verse 24 and in verse 25, he said it's hard for the rich to trust God and to enter into the kingdom of God. This is repeated, by the way, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 through 26. Now, we read passages where the, the Lord Jesus came and preached to the poor. 
in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, and Matthew 11 and verse 5. And so, evidently, the poor have a peculiar privilege to be saved. In other words, when we're destitute, when it comes to physical things, then we, we understand what it means to, to trust someone else for help. And so, Christ preached to the poor, and again, they seem to respond more so than the rich to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The rich have need of nothing, and since they have no need of financial things, then they feel like, in many cases, they have no need of spiritual things. Now, they are rich people that get saved, and they're lost people that go to hell. But we're talk- They're poor people, rather, that go to hell. But we're talking about, in general, the poor uh, has a tendency to trust more than the rich. Now, what is interesting, as you read through the Scripture, and I want you to stay right here in Luke 18, because I'm going to read some other passages here. But let me give you just a few other uh, verses on this, speaking of the poor. When we come to the Scripture many times, God's people are styled as the poor. And then we find that the lost many times are styled as, as the rich. In other words, they're always reaching and trying to get more of this world's goods and so forth instead of meditating and thinking upon the things of God. I'll give an example of this. If you write down Revelation 2 9, we may read that passage a little bit later. Also in Romans 12 and verse 11, Isaiah 57 verse 17, and a really a good passage on this is uh, Psalms 23 and verse 12, and then in 2 Corinthians 6.10. Now, what I'm going to do is read in James 2, verses 5 through 7, and I think this passage really brings home what I just said. I'm reading in James 2, verses 5 through 7, and then we're going to read again in Luke chapter 18. He says here in verse 5, he said, Hearken, my beloved brethren... Hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Verse 7, do not they, referring to the rich, do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? A clear text that is contrasting the poor who are rich in faith with the rich who reject the Lord God. Now, coming back to Luke chapter 18, I'd like to begin reading in verse 9. Now, let's come back to the thought of being poor in spirit. And that's really our text and what we want to focus in on here today. You can be... Uh, you can be rich or in physical things or poor, and if you'll be obedient to the gospel, you can be considered as poor in spirit. You see, this is one of the problems with many Americans in our country is that we have two major problems, and it is that we are proud and most of us are rich as far as what other people have in other parts of the world. We are very proud in this country. We love to talk about being the number one in everything. Well, we're probably number one in sin and wickedness, uh, that's for sure. But Americans are very proud, and many of us are rich in the sense that we uh, have much more than most do around the world. But now notice with me. As we read in Luke chapter 18, now I'm going to back off for for the rest of the message now with the physical poverty, and I'm going to talk about spiritual poverty. Because in our text we read just a moment ago, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does he mean when he says poor in spirit? Well, it has the ideal of recognizing our spiritual poverty in that we are spiritually bankrupt before a holy and a righteous God. 
when he talks about being poor in spirit, he's not talking about being poor physically and in body. But he, when he talks about being poor in spirit, he's talking about our inner being, our inner man, or our inner life. In other words, poor in spirit is needed to be saved, and also as a Christian we are to cultivate it, for it is a part of the new nature. To be poor in spirit has the ideal of humility. It is to be humble and lowly in our own eyes. It is to be emptied of self-righteousness and self-confidence. It is to be emptied of self-importance and self-sufficiency. It is the opposite of pride. It is to be totally dependent upon God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we read here, coming now, we read in in Luke chapter 18. I want to back up to verse 9 and read in verse 9 down to about verse 14. We have a contrast between two men. He begins here in verse 9, he said, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Verse 10, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Verse 14 now. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other, for every one. Now, here's the key. Here's the answer to Matthew 5, verse 3. He says, For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And again, this is illustrated in the next few verses. So, we see very clearly that to be poor in spirit is to realize our spiritual poverty in that we are spiritually bankrupt before a holy and righteous God. In other words, it's realizing that we are a sinner, that we have broken God's law, we have violated His commandments, and and it's to see ourselves as we are, poor in spirit. We have today in our society and also in the world the cult of self. In other words, this is probably the biggest cult in the world. We talk about cults. Well, self-assurance, self-reliance, self-love, self-examination, self-image. In other words, we have, we have the cult of self. And it is in total opposition to what God has said in His Word. Now, I'm going to mention a few verses to you. Psalms chapter 34. I'm reading just a few verses here. Psalms chapter 34. I'm going to read in verse 6 and also in verse 18. Now, it says here in verse 6, it said, The poor man cried, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The poor man cried unto the Lord, and the Lord saved him. In verse, in verse 18, in verse 18, we have these words. He said, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Now, we see this broken heart, and a contrite spirit many, many times in the Scripture. We see it in Isaiah chapter 57 and in verse 15. We see it in Isaiah 66 and verse 2. We see it with the story of David in Psalms chapter 51, and it's mentioned many other places in the Holy Scripture. 
In other words, we find that a, the word contrite actually means broken. So a contrite or a broken and humble heart is what it takes to, to receive favor from God Almighty. I'm reading in Ephesians chapter 4. In the book of Ephesians in chapter 4. I met a man my first number of years in Coden. We've been here 30 plus years now. Met a man, and I did not know him when he was wealthy, but I got to meet him after that he had become a Christian. He had had much wealth, and I think um, his business and everything bottomed up, bankruptcy or somewhere along those lines. And I met this man after he had truly trusted Christ as his Savior, and he had lost all of his material wealth. And, um, and so this man had a great love for the Lord and actually did some mission work in other countries. It took material poverty for this man to truly come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice as we come to Ephesians chapter 4, so we're talking about to be poor in spirit means to be humble and to be lowly in our own eyes. It is to be emptied of self-righteousness and self-confidence as I mentioned a moment ago. It is, it is the opposite of pride. It is to be totally and completely dependent upon the Lord. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I'm reading in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. And I'm, I want you to see the word lowly that's mentioned many times in Scripture. Again, we think too highly of ourselves. We need to read probably weekly, maybe maybe daily, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8, where we see our Savior, that He was very lowly, took up on the form of a servant. He was obedient, even obedient unto the death of dying on the cross for each and every one of us. I'm reading now in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. We have here in this text, he said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called. Now notice the words, three different, actually four different words in this passage. He said, here's how that we are to walk as a Christian with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering." forbearing one another in love. We see the word lowliness, and that's the ideal that we're talking about now, being poor in spirit. I'm turning back to Matthew chapter 5 again, and I'm going to read this. We'll read it so many times, we'll have it memorized. But notice now, we're coming to our second point, and I want to give you some examples of those who were poor in spirit. Many examples in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we find here in verse 3 again, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Again, that's those who are humble, those who are lowly in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let us consider some examples in the Holy Scripture. Let's start with the Lord Jesus Christ, right here in the book we're reading from in Matthew chapter 11. Let's notice the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through verse 30. Now, if we want to look at the Lord Jesus, we can find many, many places whereby that he was lowly in spirit. He was lowly and meek. In Matthew 8 and verse 20, if you're taking notes, in Zechariah 9 and verse 9, he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. 
In 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 2, it speaks of the meekness and gentleness of the Lord Jesus Christ. As I just mentioned in Philippians 2 verses 2 through 8, we find that he took up on the form of a servant, he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto the death. We find in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, he was rich and became poor that you and I might be saved. So the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Creator of all things and the Redeemer, He willingly humbled Himself even in the death of the cross. He made of Himself of no reputation. He had no place to lay His head. He, he was made a little lower than the angels that He actually created. When he, came, when he entered into this world, He was poor. He began life in a manger and worked in a carpenter's shop. So we, so we don't really need to go anywhere else, even though we will. We'll look at some others. But we really don't need to go anywhere else to, to have an example of what it means to be poor in spirit. That is to be humble, to be void of pride. That is to be lowly and meek. All we've got to do is go to our Savior. Well, notice in Matthew chapter 11, I'm reading in verse 28 through 30. The Lord Jesus has given an invitation here, and He says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now notice He says, learn of me. Take, our, take His yoke, and He says, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. This is what Christ said about Himself. And so He says, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If we want to know what it means to live the Christian life, and to be obedient to the Word of God and to follow what's in the Beatitudes, all we have to do is study the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's really all that we need. But God has given us much more. We even find the Lord Jesus in the book of John. He said, I can do nothing of myself. Wow, what if we could say that uh, in our own lives? I hear people brag about their abilities and their talents and their brains and their intellect and whatever. But the Lord Jesus said, I can do nothing of myself. He trusted the Heavenly Father while here in human flesh upon this earth. He trusted the Heavenly Father for everything. Let's look at another one. Let's look at the Apostle Paul. Turn with me to Philippians in chapter 3. The book of Philippians in chapter 3. Now, we're going to read here in Philippians, but what I want to do is that I just want to give you a list of some others that I will not be turning to. Philippians 3. Before I read and look at the Apostle Paul, what about Peter in Luke chapter 5 when he's seen uh, his nets filled with fish that the Lord Jesus had told him where to cast the nets? He said, He said unto the Lord, he said, I am a sinful man. He realized he stood in the presence of his Creator and his Redeemer. The prodigal son, we know his story in Luke 15, but in verse 18 and 19, when he was humbled and he was coming back to his father, here's what he said. He said, I have sinned against heaven and against thee, speaking to his father. And he says, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Now that's poor in spirit. He was haughty at one time, and he demanded his inheritance from his father. And he went off and he wasted that. But he became poor, not only physically in body, but he became poor in spirit, and his father received him back in. When Isaiah after one of the physical, literal kings in Israel had died, and Isaiah had seen the glory of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5, he said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. He goes on to speak about living in the midst of the lips in an unclean nation. In Judges chapter 6 and verse 12 through 17, Gideon said, I belong to a lowly family. 
He shrank from the very thought of greatness and honor. When the Lord had called him and wanted to use him, he said, I'm just from a lowly family. That's being poor in spirit. Moses in Exodus chapter 4 verses 10 through 17, he felt unworthy to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. When Job had went through all of his trials and his tribulations, we find that he humbled himself when he lost everything, including his health. He humbled himself, and the Bible says in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, that's Job 1 verse 20 through 23, and in, in, in Job 2 and verse 10, it says he did not sin with his lips. He humbled himself before a holy and righteous God. And another one is John the Baptist. In John chapter 3 and verse 30, he was a friend of the bridegroom. But you know what he said? He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. John the Baptist was called by God. He was the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He paved the way. And, but he was not building a big ministry or a name for himself. He said that he must decrease. Now let's notice as we read in Philippians chapter 3, I'm beginning in verse 3. I'm going to read down to about verse 7 or so. And I want you to notice how Paul describes his spiritual condition. I want you to think about this. If anyone could ever, if anyone ever had any reason to think they, they were something, that they were okay with God, it would be Paul. Because he was a Jew, he was a Pharisee, he kept the law, he was circumcised, he was very zealous, he kept the law blameless, and still yet he counted it all as dung. Why? He needed a Savior. Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus in the beginning, actually persecuting and putting to death Christians, he was humbled and he became lowly and he became poor in spirit according to Acts chapter 9 and he was saved by the grace of God. Gloriously saved, miraculously saved. And even the church at Corinth counted him as meek when he was among them. That's how others describe the Apostle Paul as well. Reading in verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews is touching the law of Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, verse 9, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of, of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. This is Paul's testimony. If anyone could boast and be prideful, the Apostle Paul could do it, but he was poor in spirit. He was humbled. He was lowly. And he was saved by the grace of God, and he preached this throughout the rest of his life. I'm turning now back to Matthew to read it for the last time. In Matthew chapter 3, notice as we come back to this passage, in Matthew, I'm sorry, Matthew 5 verse 3, and coming to our last point, and that is the reward of being poor in spirit. He says here in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now this is an amazing statement that we have here. And he's speaking of eternal life. 
He's speaking of their inheritance in the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Notice that. Again, each one of these Beatitudes begins with the word blessed. And the Greek word here is M-A-K-A-R-I-O-S. It speaks of our favored status with God, a state of happiness and joy. In other words, it shows divine favor and protection. This is a Christian distinction is how the word blessed connected with our name. And he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are the humble and lowly, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we talk about the kingdom of heaven, we're talking about eternal life and inheritance in God's kingdom. Now again, this word blessed is used many times in the Scripture. In Ephesians 1, 3, we that are saved, we that are born again, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. In Luke chapter 1, Elizabeth speaks of Mary being blessed in verse 42 because of the fruit of her womb. James chapter 1 and verse 12, those who endure temptations and trials are referred to as blessed. In Revelation 22, 14, those who keep the commandments of God are referred to as blessed, that is happy, highly favored. In Psalms 1, verse 1 and 2, I mentioned earlier, we find blessed is the man Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, but puts his faith and his delight in the law of God in verse 1 and 2 of that chapter. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, that God said that all families of the earth, all nations would be blessed through Abraham. They would be highly favored. They would be, they would have God's grace and God's mercy. God's happiness and God's protection. We find that in Genesis 1 and verse 22 that the word blessed means to pronounce divine favor and benefits. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3, it means to set apart or consecrate as God had created uh, everything and on the seventh day He blessed that seventh day. He set it apart. It is to be holy And he said, blessed is that day. Psalms 103, verses 1 and 2, uh, it basically means to praise God for all His benefits. There's another Greek word. It's E-U-L-O-G-E-O. We get our English word eulogy from either the root word or a similar word. And, And basically... Uh, this Greek word that's translated blessed in other places is used to give a good report or to say a good word or to speak well of. When you talk about eulogies, we speak uh, well of or give a report. Now notice in verse 3, he says in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's talk for a few moments about the kingdom of heaven. Now, when we read the parallel passage earlier in Luke 6 and verse 20, we find that the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God. There are those who want to make a distinction between these terminologies, and we find they're the same. Because in Luke 6, 20, he mentions the kingdom of God. In Matthew 5, 3, he mentions the kingdom of heaven. They're parallel passages. What is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God? Well, we find that here that the kingdom of heaven, they're blessed because they belong to the kingdom of heaven and the gift of eternal life or everlasting life. Notice in verse 10, 
He said here in verse uh, 10, He said, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice with me as we come down to verse 19. He said, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Turn with me again to chapter 4. In chapter 4, we can turn loose of our text now. Chapter 4 and in verse 17. Chapter 4 and verse 17 he says here in verse 17, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is what we're talking about. Notice again in Matthew chapter 8, eight let's see, Matthew 18 rather. Matthew chapter 18, and I'm reading in verse 4. So what is the kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom of God? Well, it's the spear of God's rule. It is called a heavenly kingdom, a spiritual kingdom, and an eternal kingdom. Write down John chapter 18 and verse 36. The Lord Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. It is also called the Father's kingdom in Matthew 22 verse 29. It is called Christ's kingdom in Colossians 1 and verse 13. It says, we, have, we who are saved have been translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. It is called a heavenly kingdom in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 8. So notice now as we come to Matthew 18 and verse 4. And he says this, he said, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of of heaven. Again, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God has to do with eternal life. Notice one more time on this, Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 21, there's a parable here that is given. But notice in verse 43, I'm just going to kind of cut into the text. He said in verse 43, he said, Therefore say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Now, he's talking to the chief priests and Pharisees in verse 45. He says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, was taken away from the national Israel, and it was given to believing Israel. It was given to the believing Jews and later Gentiles got in on this. And so he's taking this kingdom of God away from the nation and giving it to the believing Jews. And then as we read through the book of Acts and down to our time, we know that Gentiles are a part of this kingdom. And this, this nation in verse 43 is called a holy nation in 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 9. And also, the little flock in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, they would receive the kingdom because the, the believers were the ones that were bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now I want you to notice with me in Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14. So what is the reward for those who are poor in spirit? The reward is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And when we talk about the kingdom, we're talking about eternal life, everlasting life. Now notice in Romans chapter 14, there basically, when we talk about the kingdom, there is a present reality of the kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven, but there's also a future aspect of that kingdom. Let's first of all talk about the present reality. The present reality is that it is a spiritual kingdom. The Lord Jesus in Matthew 16 verse 19 gave the keys of the kingdom to the believers, to the disciples. We find that in John 18 36, I mentioned a moment ago, he's, it's a spiritual kingdom. Again, I mentioned Colossians 1 13. We have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. That is a present reality. 
And even in the book of Revelation in chapter 1, John is writing to the seven churches of Asia. And he said, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Notice that. He was their companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. But notice now, as we come to Romans chapter 14, and I'm going to be reading in verse 17 and 18, I believe this illustrates the present reality of the kingdom of God. In other words, we entered into the kingdom, spiritually speaking, through the new birth through believing what is called the gospel of the kingdom. That gospel of the kingdom was preached by John the Baptist. It was preached by the Lord Jesus. It was preached by the apostles. And it was preached by Paul and others. We find that throughout the uh, book of Acts. Well, notice now in Romans chapter 14, verse 17 and 18, he said, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, Notice, he said, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things, that is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Verse 18, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Please notice that the kingdom of God today is not meat and drink. It's not physical things. But the kingdom of God today, not just in the future, but today, is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So there is a present reality of this kingdom. Again, the Lord said, I will take it from national Israel and give it to believing Israel, the Israel of God. But there's also a future aspect of the kingdom. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 4.18, the last book that he wrote before his execution, he spoke of the future reality of the kingdom, and he said that the Lord would preserve him unto his heavenly kingdom. That is mentioned again in 1 Peter 1, verses 1 through 5. The Lord Jesus said in Luke 19.10, Occupy until He comes again. Then in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51, Flesh and blood shall not enter into the kingdom of God. What is the future reality of this kingdom that the poor in spirit shall inherit? In other words, they are in it, spiritually speaking, but one day physically. What is it? It's new heavens, new earth, New city, New Jerusalem, and also new glorified, resurrected bodies. That is the ultimate aspect or the future aspect or reality of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Now notice as we come to the book of Matthew this time in chapter 7. This is where we're going to close. In Matthew chapter 7. Now, the natural man, according to 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man receiveth not the things, the spiritual things of God. He has no discernment in them. But those who are poor in spirit, they're called blessed. And they're called blessed and happy because they have an inheritance And that inheritance, that reward, is the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Now let us close in Matthew 7. Matthew 7 is also a part of the Sermon on the Mount. First of all, let me read from verse 21 through 23. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. In other words, we see this expression again in verse 24 about doing the will of the Father. What is the will of the Father? It's becoming poor in spirit. 
It's repentance, it's faith in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So notice he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Those that do the will of the Father in heaven are those who become poor in spirit, for they shall and they are promised the kingdom of heaven. Verse 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Notice, they did not become poor in spirit. They are not blessed. They have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Even though they profess to do many things in Christ's name, they did it their way and in their own ability as Cain did in Genesis 4. Cain is mentioned again in Second Peter, the book of Jude. He's mentioned also in First John, I believe it's chapter 3. We find that Cain did it his way. Now, Cain believed and knew there was a God. Cain worshipped God, but he wasn't saved. Cain had a place to worship, as Abel did. He had a time to worship, as Abel did. And he had a way to worship, that is, to bring a sacrifice, as Abel did. Abel came before the Lord at the right time, with the right sacrifice, what God had commanded, But Cain did it his way, and Cain's worship was rejected. He says in verse 21, 22, and 23, Depart from me. Depart from me. I never knew you. In other words, I never knew you in a saving way, in a covenant way. And then he illustrates this in verse 24 through 29. He said, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, Again, doeth them to become humble, to become lowly, to become poor in spirit. He says, and doeth them. He said, I will like him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. In other words, we see two groups of people in the world today, those who humble themselves, become poor in spirit, and they're repentative and they have faith, They're the ones that build upon this rock. Jesus is called the rock. He's called the chief cornerstone. And there were many that stumbled over this stone, but there were many that believed. The Bible says in 1 Peter, verses 1 through 9, that those who believe He is precious unto them, and those who disobey, it says there that they stumble at His word. They stumble at the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the saved man humbles himself, becomes poor in spirit, and he builds upon this rock. In other words, he does what the Lord says. The Bible says that we must be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is repentance and faith that goes into eternal life, whereby we may inherit the kingdom. But the foolish man, he did not do them. He did it his way. He did it exactly as Cain did, and they were destroyed as Cain was destroyed. Now let's close in verse 13 and in 14. Verse 13 and 14. He says here in these passages, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Notice this. 
He said in verse 14, Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. We find that this door, this gate is narrow and low. And the first step of entering into the kingdom of heaven is humility. It's lowliness. It is to be come poor in spirit. As we come to a close here this morning, I would pray that all are saved, but no one is saved until they humble themselves before the Lord and they become poor in spirit and by faith trust in Jesus Christ, believing that He's the Savior, believing that He shed His blood for their sins at Calvary's cross. That is the gospel according to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scripture. No one is saved without that. We must humble ourselves before a holy and a righteous God. We must admit, acknowledge, confess that we're sinners, and confess the Lord Jesus as our Savior. The Bible is very clear that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved in Romans 10 and in verse 13. But not only do the lost need to hear this, we that are Christians, we that are saved, let us be Christ-like. Because to be poor in spirit is to be Christ-like, for He was poor in spirit. He humbled Himself. He became obedient. He considered himself as lowly and meek. Let us, as Christians, walk this away. Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee for this day and this truth and the Word that You've given to us. Lord, we thank You for the many blessings that You bestowed upon us. We thank You for the privilege of the inheritance of the kingdom of God. Lord, we just praise You and thank You for all that You've accomplished for us. We thank You, Lord Jesus, for being our Creator and our Redeemer. Heavenly Father, we pray today, Thy will to be done in our hearts as we look at this text. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.